All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. We are going to be talking to a great guitar player today. I think everybody knows him. Uh, you know the big four. If there was five, I think he'd be the one. Uh, his band, Testament. We are going to get into his career. There's a lot more than Testament to talk about, so we're not going to waste any time. We'll talk to Alex Skolnick right after this. Just All right, here he is, Alex Skolnick. Hey, hey, hey. what's happening, Jason? Hey, Alex. Now, I'm glad that you're here. Now you're you're in Brooklyn now, right? Yes, yes. Been uh, a Brooklyn, uh, a Brooklyn transplant. I've been here since the mid O's, <laughs> and um, quite quite comfortable here. Yeah, nice. Well, well, you started in Berkeley, California, right? Yes. And, and I so, kind of found my way home because uh, my uh, family is originally from New York. Uh, my father grew up in Brooklyn, different part of Brooklyn than I'm in, much further out. But uh, Brooklyn, it's always been there. And uh, I've always felt a certain kinship whenever I've seen movies based in Brooklyn or shows like Welcome Back, Cotter. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, somehow once I ended up here, it just felt very natural. Well, and you've seen the progression. I'm a New Yorker originally, so Brooklyn has come a long way. It's not what it, it's not this industrial area that it used to be. Brooklyn has a tourism and a uh, you know it's a big thing now. Yeah, even when I moved here, it was still kind of on its way up. You know, the, the whole idea of like taxis in Manhattan not wanting to go to Brooklyn, right? Was the thing. Yeah, now it's you can catch a cab here. They're yeah, gone. it's completely. It, it, yeah, you know, and more people want to actually want to live in Brooklyn. It seems when they move to the city, than not. Whereas it used to be considered this step down. It was like a second class thing, and that's when I moved here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. most people do the reverse, like you did. Most people all head west. But yeah, you, you grew up out west. It's uh, to me, it's more interesting to move east. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Yeah, because there's a lot of guys. You know, I had Johnny Kelly on. He's from Brooklyn. You know, from Typo Negative, and uh, mm -hmm. he, him, and his wife had enough of those New York winters. And so yeah. I talked to a I lot of guys who who do it. But I get it. If you're on the West Coast, sometimes you do the opposite uh, change. Yeah, I mean, if you grow up on the West Coast, you're used to no snow every winter. Uh, most days feel relatively the same. It's a nice change. And maybe, you know, it's not for everybody. I'm not judging anybody else, but I know there is, um, there's a lot of skepticism when I left. Yeah. You know, people I grew up with say, well, you know, why would you ever want to live there? That's, that's where people want to escape from. You know, it's this myth. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's actually a lot of reasons to be here um you know culturally it's there's a lot going on it's a cultural center of the world it's also in the middle of the world going to europe or the uk at least is like flying to the west coast it's not a big deal right yeah um, that's way more convenient yeah and you're also closer to other major cities boston is not that far away dc is not that far away philadelphia is even closer Whereas, um, you know, San Francisco, the San Francisco Bay Area and um, L.A. are both, they're both these big metropolises, but they're kind of isolated. There's not, you know, they're, they're like eight hours away from each other. Seattle is like another eight hours. Things are, the, the big um, centers out west are further apart. And sure. I think that everything's closer out here you, you feel that and there's a different pace which i like and um yeah it just it feels natural i again it's not for everybody I, but over the the years i've been here uh i've seen quite a few friends come and go that have given it a try i'll get a phone call that somebody's moving to new york you know hey i'm gonna be by the time we get to meet up. I find they've, they've left already. They've been chewed up and 
spit out. <laughs> they they yeah. went back home. So that's it's not it. for everyone. But if for some of us, if you get here and, oh, this, this just feels right. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're going to get back to New York because uh, it comes up later in your career as well. But uh, right now, let's, let's so we're talking about Berkeley, California, where you grew up yep. in Bay Area. And, you know, you're, you're influenced by a lot of the guitar players that everybody was inspired by. My, my, my question is, you know, so you become one of the students of Joe Satriani and he has this cra crazy list of students. I, I'd hate to be the guy who studied with Joe Satriani and did not uh, have a, a credit after, you know, mm -hmm. he, uh, Kirk Hammett from Metallica, Steve Vai, yourself. And, and that's just, uh, you know, the guitar player for Third Eye Blind. He, it, was, it wasn't just metal uh, shredding guys, Exodus, Primus, Counting Crows. Counting so it was, Crows, Smash Mouth. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty it's, nice. it's, Pretty crazy. So you tell me, one, how do you meet Joe? And also, what was it like? Yeah, well, the guy, I, I had studied with a few different players. So I, I had an older brother who played in some local bands. So I got to see clubs and go to load-ins, accompanying my brother, just seeing what that was like at a really young age. And um, in the circles my brother was in, there were a couple, he, he played, he started on guitar, but he switched to bass. And there were a couple different guitar players that he played with that were pretty advanced for the, they were kind of like the best in, the, in their neighborhoods, so to speak, and best on the block, you know? And I studied with a couple of these guys and I was, I guess I was improving pretty fast because, uh, it felt like I needed to study with, you know, with a more serious teacher. And I knew both of these guys had studied with this sort of mysterious guy named Joe. And I just knew he had an Italian last name. And he was somebody that you would hear. He was like a cautionary tale about the music industry. Because apparently he was so good. The fact that nobody outside the Bay Area knew his name is proof that nobody should enter the music industry. Mm. <laughs> now, of course, that would change, but in a very short time, in a few years. But at that time, yeah, he was just, you know, the, the serious musician. And there weren't that many musicians. I think he was the only one that I was aware of that sort of had the... Um, mystique of a classical piano teacher with strictness and the discipline and you know you better be serious otherwise it's you're wasting it's, it's very it's bad so he he was the guitar player that had that energy and um i started with him when i was 14 years old and some of the players I would run into, like Larry from, uh, he Primus. was in Best at the time, but he would go on to join Primus. Um, you know, the guys in Exodus who were still a club band. At that time, like, these weren't people that everybody knew at, at the right. time. You know, they were just young, very young, aspiring players. You know, Joe was just the, uh, you know, the, the teacher, the great local teacher that we, we knew we were lucky to have him in our backyard. Mm -hmm. But I don't think any of us knew how, um, how well known he would become. It's great. And it was so, it made sense that he became well known. Now, the first um, time I got an idea that he might become well known was um, I was a big Ingve fan. Ingve was brand new at that point. And I was learning a lot of his licks and Joe would show me some of them, but he would also sort of steer me away from trying to play too much like Ingve. He said, you shouldn't try to play too much like anybody. And that was a, that was a great lesson because a lot of players make the mistake of trying to be like the, um, whatever player is getting the most attention, you know, and, and in a few years he would be one of those players getting the most attention. For sure. But around during the time I'm taking lessons from him, uh, 
Ingve leaves his band. His band is called Alcatraz and is replaced by Frank Zappa's guitarist named C. Vi. And this was the first I'd ever heard of him. And Joe, I, I remember asking Joe, you know, who's this guy that replaced? And he said, oh, I know him. <laughs> I know him well. He's from Long Island. Um, he used to study with me. But he's been with Zappa for, you know, so that was really interesting. And then seeing um, Vi join David Lee Ross. And next thing you know, Vi's profile is rising. So it made sense that with, you know, with, with Vi kind of rising on, on to that level and putting out his own instrumental music, uh, Joe would likely be next and that's exactly what happened Vi, as we all know Vi recommended joe to his to the label it was relativity records right and that's when it started and during the time i was studying with joe i auditioned for my first band and it was the band that would become the testament yeah and, legacy yeah it was called legacy at the time and I was, uh, I guess I was 16 at that, no, I was 15 at that point. Um, and that was, yeah, and he, Joe was very encouraging and just encouraged me to just get as much experience as I could. And by the time I had my first gig coming up with the band, Joe had to take a hiatus from teaching because he had this new record deal mm -hmm. and was working on his first instrumental record. And then that was right when the world would find out about him, but it was all, you know, fortune. And I'm, I'm, you know, just glad he was there at the time. And I'm glad I had the sense to, and the bravery in a way, because you have to make, he had such a mystique surrounding him. I mean, he was really, it was really like going to a strict classical teacher and yeah, you had to make that decision it's like, okay i'm going to be more serious i'm going to study with this guy and just face the consequence and just really get it together i think for a long time we heard about you know J joe was like you know mr miyagi this mysterious teacher and i think people heard about it, but i don't think people really knew so much of what it was like and the way that he taught and that it was that you know there was a serious structure um you know, I think that that's a, I find it interesting that what it was like to be, to be going to this guy who, and it is a funny thing when you look for teachers, sometimes people think, well, what has he done? You know, he might be great, but he, he's giving me advice. Well, you know, where's his big credit? And of course it was just a matter of time before, you know, Joe's a grandma. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, cool. never say that again. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, okay. So let's talk about legacy a little bit. Uh, you know, this is the early beginnings, that, you know, because, you, Testament went for a while. Legacy went for a while before you became Testament. You guys were out there working it like the other bands in the Bay Area. So tell me what, a little bit of what it's like at that time. Well, it's kind of amazing to think that it was just a few years. You know what I mean? <laughs> From the time I joined the band, the band had already formed. And it was formed by Eric Peterson. And they had done a few shows uh, supporting kind of up and coming heavy bands. Right. So they supported Slayer on one of their first shows in the Bay Area. They supported Exodus. They did, so I kept hearing about them and I kept hearing, yeah, okay, this is probably like the next band to watch out for. And I'd been trying to put together bands and high school and at that time not as many kids played instruments as today you sure. know I, mean, I i had a few years under my belt and i was ready to start gigging and i didn't really know any other musicians that were ready some of them were starting um especially for the heavy now now you can find you know eight-year-olds that are very proficient on the instrument and have youtube channels but it was not like that back then so I was yeah, getting there was no YouTube. There was no YouTube to go learn your your. There wasn't plan. even a YouTube. Exactly, exactly. And I was just getting frustrated, just thinking, okay, I, you know, I and I I don't I, I've gotten much better at this, but I did not have um, leadership skills. 
I did not have communication skill. Like all, <laughs> I had a lot to learn. All I knew how to do was to play a guitar. So I sensed that uh, the best thing for me would be to join a band that is already playing and lead, needs a guitar player. So no sooner had I had this realization than I get word that this band that I've been hearing about, uh, the guitar player has left the band, one of the guitar, not the founding member, but the other one. And uh, they're looking for a new guitar player. And uh, that was how that started. Yeah. So, and now Chuck Billy's not in the band at this time. The other, uh, so tell us who the lead singer was for Legacy at that point. Yeah. Um, so the lead singer was Steve Souza, also known as Zetro. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of amazing to think like what would happen in really uh, got two years, right? Because I joined the band in late 1985, sure. I think. No, I'm sorry, late 1984, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. So I do my first show with the band in early 1985. And I'm 16 years old. And Steve is the singer. So in within two years, we'll be in the studio recording our first album. Steve will have joined the band Exodus. Right. Which, you know, he would be in off and on for years. He's back in the band now, as we speak. And yes, that's the legacy that that would be our debut album. But that was all in, in, in two years. So in two years, we had two different, I joined the band. So there were two different guitar players, <laughs> two different lead guitar players, um, two different singers, two different drummers, because the dr drummer Louis Clancy left shortly after I joined. And then he, came back, he regretted leaving, and he was very close with Eric, who had founded the band, and uh, the drummer we'd had in the meantime wasn't working out as well. So Louie came back, and we found Chuck. <clears throat> and this It's just amazing to me this all happened in two years. I mean, we don't even do a record cycle in two years anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, it's usually like three years average between records with many tours. So this all happened during that time. We went from me joining the band as a high school sophomore to recording this album that would come out later that year in 1987 and hitting yeah. the road that same year with bands like... Uh, Anthrax and Overkill, who were connected to the label Mega Force Records. Yeah, and you, because you, you guys definitely were working it. You, you, there was no resting. It was you guys were on the hustle. It was a different scene, though. The Bay Area thrash scene is very different. You know, L.A. had you know its glam metal scene, and and yeah. and, uh, and then New York had a different scene as well. But so for you guys, uh, you you know, it's it's a totally different thing to get signed. It's not like you're out doing the flyers and the Hollywood thing. It's it's a different thing. So tell me what it's like to get this record deal. Well, um, it was very uh, methodical. You know, it wasn't like some huge break. It was more like, you know, there were. I, I guess I don't want to call it extreme battle, but yeah, we you know, you call it thrash metal or related types of metal. It was it was picking up. So you were having, you know, there were magazines popping up like Metal Hammer, um, Kerrang, you know, these European magazines started to find their way to the US. And there were a bunch of smaller labels popping up. Yeah, Music for Nations, Roadrunner. Megaforce. Uh, some of them were even smaller. And there were just so many records coming out. So it 
it seemed like either way, whatever happened, it seemed like we would at least be able to put out a record on one of these small, small labels. So Megaforce was one of the biggest of the small labels. And they were just one of many labels that we talked to. We talked to a whole bunch of labels. Um, you know, Megaforce had been Metallica's label. Right. Metallica had moved on to uh, a major label, Elektra. But um, the fact that they were associated with Metallica, who was now sort of, you know, just starting to blow up like on a level beyond what anybody could have imagined. Um, that was a plus. And then uh, Megaforce signed a distribution deal with Atlantic Records. So we knew that, you know, there was no way a you know, band as extreme as sounding as us, you know, a bunch of like rag, raggedy misfits from the Bay Area, there's no way a label like Atlantic is going to look at us. Right. But they were, they would look at, you know, being a, a uh, an umbrella for a label like Megaforce, especially because Megaforce had just was associated with Metallica. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, they had, they found one band that, you know, reach was reaching a level. They must know what they're doing. That call, yeah, uh, yeah. So maybe between all these bands, yeah, you know, if we have them in our family of, you know, of labels that we distribute, um, maybe you know, maybe one of them will, you know, or maybe overall it'll it'll be a, a good situation. Now they ended up not renewing that deal. So I, I think I think it worked out okay, but ultimately it wasn't worth Atlantic's um, uh, resources to to keep Megaforce. But they had a clause in the contract that they were allowed to pick um, some bands from the label and sign them directly to Atlantic. So this took place by, I guess, the fourth or fifth Testament record. And Atlantic chose us. They chose. I think they chose Kings X. They, I, whichever bands they chose. I remember it just it decimated the label, unfortunately. So, uh, so there were a few years where it was Megaforce with Atlantic distribution, but by um, the fifth album, The Ritual, it was a straight up Atlantic record, and that never That's would have happened without that deal. Gotcha. Well, we're going to jump through some of those real quick because there are five uh, of the classic era Testament records with you. So yep. we'll go through those. But um, at this time, so there was a band called Testament already. And so, I mean, excuse me, called Legacy called already. Legacy. Yeah. yeah. And so was it was it Billy Milano who suggested the name Testament to you guys? That's a true story. Yeah. So we were reaching out to everybody. Yeah. Like at that point, you know, we... We were all set to go in the studio. We had our record deal. And, you know, we were just so green when our uh, attorney at the time said, um, you know, he brought up the uh, the subject of a trademark search. Mm -hmm. And we said, what? Trademark what? What is that? You know, it's no big deal, but you just need to do this just before they put out the record just to make sure nobody else has the name. And of course, yeah, you know, we're panicking. There's no way anybody else could have the name. It's our, I've never heard of anybody with our name. Yeah. You know, right. Sure enough, you run, <laughs> you do you run the trademark search and there's some hotel band called legacy. Like a plays. top 40 tribute kind of thing. Something like that. Yeah. That plays, I think in New, or New Orleans and mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you know, they have the name. They've, you know, that's it. That's it. You know, so uh, we put out an all points bulletin. Um, Megaforce asked a lot of their people and their musicians, and Megaforce had uh, SOD 
the Anthrax side project with Billy Milano as the singer. And he had come up with the name Testament. So it was one of, I don't even remember any other name that was considered. It was like the only one that seemed okay. And what's funny is, now with the success of testament we couldn't imagine the band being called anything else you know the, right exactly i mean you, that's a, the band makes the the name so now it's it, it yeah it makes perfect and, and and now it seems like a great name because it's got this um weight behind it but at the time it was yeah it was it just felt very mediocre um it's also got it's got this great logo Yes. Now I don't. I don't take credit for the logo. You know that Eric was more in the art department, but I do take credit for noticing that the letters mm -hmm. it had this um, symmetrical number of letters. Right there's the A in the middle, and then three letters to the left, three letters to the right, and then T's on both ends. So I just remember saying okay oh, you we could totally do something interesting with the logo by like mm -hmm. combining the t's and like you know emphasizing the a that that's it i didn't draw the logo i think eric actually drew it but it was once we sort of started looking at it imagining it as a um a t-shirt right or on an album it it seems like, you know, we could do much worse. <laughs> and again, same thing with, with kids on their notebooks drawing, you know, logos and things. If you're a thrash fan, Metallica's logo, Anthrax's logo, Testament's logo, the, they do stand out, you know, yeah. with, with with the band. And you couldn't imagine um, another one. So we're going to jump through these real quick. Uh, that's 1987. You talk about it, you get on the road with Anthrax Overkill. Somehow you guys managed to crank out a record every year at this point which not many people were doing so here we are the new uh new order this is 88. yeah it's insane to me now yeah just it would never happen again i don't think yeah so yeah, tell me no, nobody does a record every, every year i mean now we're lucky if anyone even makes a record you, you know but so tell me what what's the decision get back in the studio fast what is the thought process with getting another record well, it was just what was done back then. Uh, a record cycle was considered about a year. And you do it one or two tours in the U.S., one or two tours overseas. And after that, it's, it's, it's pretty limited unless you get picked up for like a great support tour. Right. Um, at that time, you know, we were dependent on something called tour support from where the label finances your tour. And there were limits to how much they would find it. They would absolutely finance, you know, a solid run through the U.S. and through Europe. Um, late after this record japan was part of the equation but uh japan is always done through uh and a different label like an associated label but not direct um but for so after this record yeah we would always go to japan we'd always go to europe we'd always go, but yeah each time once we had been to those places once that, that's it okay we got to get ran it. Through it. yeah we and need to do the next record. Of course, I mean, in some ways, it's good because you're fulfilling your contract. Yeah. Well, I think it was great for you guys, but for, you know, for a lot of the hard rock bands, I think they jumped on those festival tours. I mean, the arena tours, and because most bands didn't get five records in the time that you did in that same period. If you look at some of the bigger platinum acts, maybe they did two records and maybe the third record came out when grunge was already done with them. Whereas I think some of the heavier bands survived a little bit better. And like you said, you had one run. There was only so many bands that were able to do one of these tours. And so you, you went back into the studio and you, and you cranked out another record. Um, 
So let's talk about it. Let's let's keep going. So this is 88. Now we're going on to um, 1989 and practice what you preach. And I think this is I, I think this is kind of a breakthrough record for you guys as far as MTV goes and crossing into, you know, a mainstream market. I mean, you tell me if that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it had actually started the album before mm -hmm. um, because the show Headbangers Ball had started. And we became one of the regular uh, bands that you would see on Headbangers Ball. Right. And you had, and there was tracks off that record that were getting play. And also, um, you know, Radio 2, uh, you know, uh, Into the Pit, Trial by Fire. Some of these things were starting to take off. Yeah. Yeah. And it, um, Trial by Fire, the, a clip from Trial by Fire even got used in an MTV promo. That's funny. With like a bunch of other mainstream videos, yeah. So it, uh, it just, yeah, it sort of. It reached this next level. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a huge level, but it was certainly less underground. And yeah, people are seeing us on cable television. And that increased with the next album, Practice What You Preach, which is right there. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Because now, like you said, so you're getting some play, but now this is getting played also with some of the more, you know, I don't want to say pop bands, but it's getting played where I think more people are, are seeing it. And I think maybe people who didn't know some of the heavier bands were becoming more um, open to it. Yeah, that's definitely true. And then you had uh, a ballad on this record called The Ballad, which yeah. also was very timely. I think, I think there was a lot of people who, you know, were listening to, uh, you know, Guns N' Roses or whoever else, and now saying, well, hey, I like this too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, there were there was something for fans that might not have been, like, all in with the thrash genre. Right. And, you know, we had yeah we we would have these moments like you know the, the ballad or uh in the introduction to trial by fire which had been a video off the previous album so there was this different flavor going on and um and also you know i i re respected that a lot of the influences had almost more of like a garage style of guitar playing, you know, Motorhead, mm -hmm. Venom, right? It was like the guitar style was like garage rock. But I had studied with Satriani and I was a big fan of Ro Randy Rhodes, Eddie Van Halen, you know, still am to, to this day. Sure. And I was trying, I wanted to put that into the music. And uh, yeah, that by this time, you know, Joe is touring, and there's this whole guitar community building up. And I just, I wanted like those fans to be able to come to a testament show. And yeah, yeah, okay, it's not going to be like instrumental rock, you know, it's not going to be like a Satriani show, but you know, at least. I wanted the quality of the the lead guitar playing to be something they they could get into, and absolutely, I would hear, and it was great because I I would hear from people, you know, like people would tell me afterwards, yeah, you know, I I got dragged here by my buddy that likes the trash stuff. I'm I'm into you know Satch and and Vi, but I'm surprised, like I like liked the guitar playing. The and marketing I think on this record, it, it really they really started to that that the guitar segment of the audience started to increase. Yes, the marketing of you as a guitar hero and and all, all you know obviously do your playing is is great, uh, but it it was working because uh, and I see some bands they didn't get that with you. You were right up there with all you know people knew. You, you know, they knew the guitar player of Testament. They knew if they read the guitar magazines, they knew. And fans who were guitar driven definitely got into that music um, 
you know, because of your playing. And it, and it was certainly marketed, you know, well to get you in these magazines and to get you these endorsements and things. At the time, that was something important, very important. Well, for re um, heavy music, it was pretty rare. Right. Um, yeah. Certainly with my friend Marty Friedman, that was the case. But he hadn't even, he hadn't been in a thrash band. Like he had come from these very melodic bands. He was in a band called Hawaii. That was a very technical band that, you know, sounded, you know, much different. And then he joined Megadeth as a, and it was a great fit. And I, I was actually happy about it because then I, I wasn't the only one sort of, you know, playing very technically and melodically in heavy music. But right. at the time that, that was really rare. So I, I think there, there was a void there. There needed to be some um, advanced technical, play, hopefully emotional playing too. I tried to put a lot of feel into it as well. Yeah, but you definitely it, weren't just shredding. It wasn't how many notes can I play? There was obviously feel to your playing. And, and there were songs. That, that was the other thing. Yeah. There, there were songs behind. Uh, so it wasn't just, you know, just shredding. There, there, there's music to it. So, okay, so we're, we're going through it. Now it's 1990, and it's hard to believe we're, we're four records in. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, Souls of Black right here. So... Same thing. You guys are doing the touring. I saw you guys on the Practice What You Preach tour in New York City uh, at the Ritz, which was Studio 54 before that. Um, and so uh, then Souls of Black comes out. Tell me what it's like at this point. Yeah, well, this this time we had been offered um, uh, to support uh, Judas Priest and Megadeth. So Huge. Yeah, that was... A chance to play arenas which we'd never done but to do that we needed they you know to, and to have the tour support to do that we needed a new record now i think if it were today i mean really you know this is 1990 the practice we preach had just come out that the year before yep that was still a current record and would have really made sense to tour off them. So, yeah, those of black has, has some great material, but it's the it was the first album where you know I think the, the pressure affected the the record. I think it would have been better. And the, I'm not this is not news. It's been talked about quite a bit. But um, if we had more time, if right. we had yeah, you know, if it wasn't you know, rushed just so we could get, get on this tour. And it's unfortunate because, uh, yeah, that, that just created, put a lot of pressure, unnecessary pressure on the band. Yeah, I can imagine. And I, and I, and, and there's a lot of bands that said that at this point, you've got to get, you know, even though, like you said, practice we preach is still new. There is this thing where everyone's trying to crank, um, you know, crank something out. So yeah, um, you, you do that tour though. And uh, obviously, it's successful for you guys. Yeah, it was a it was an interesting experience. Um, but again, it, we it never felt like we got some huge break. To me, each time was sort of like this uh, lesson mm -hmm. in reality. Yeah, you know, I'd always imagined it as some huge break. You know, you sign your record deal. Next thing you know, it just all the doors open up and you're uh you know you don't even have to think about it <laughs> it'll just happen and you know you learn very quickly that um that, well the, you know there's so much once you sign the record deal like that that's when the work starts and you're also depending on it it depends on your uh, position in the marketplace. I mean, we're doing a style of music at that point. It's still considered very left field. Yeah. Um, it's there isn't a template for producing that kind of music. It's very hard to find, uh, you know, producers to work with. That, um, that yeah, it's very hard to get w what we have in mind. We don't even really know what we have in mind. And then, you know, you imagine your first arena tour 
and you you expect that to be this super you know next level big league thing, but you actually find out well you're opening, so not everybody's in the even in the arena yet, and uh, the ones that are there, many of them are there to see the headliner, and it's not the same audience, so. You know, yeah, there were some, there were some very, some great shows, some memorable moments. It was great to play the, these big places, but it definitely, um, it, it was def- definitely like like a reality of the business. Plus, at that point, Judas Priest is going through their own sort of midlife crisis, and right. Rob Halford would be leaving the band after that tour. So, you know, it just, yeah, it wasn't this hunky dory glamorous. Yeah. That wasn't bad. I mean, it was, it was great in, in some ways, but it's better than it working was, for a living, but yeah, yeah. It's, it was exactly, it was a reality. A dose, dose of reality. All right. The ritual 1992. You skipped a year for once. You guys, <laughs> you guys took a little, yeah. a little extra time. Yeah. At that point, my God, the band really really needed a break um on the other hand i kept playing so <laughs> yeah you were playing with Stu ham when this record came out is that right um yeah well before the, before it came out yeah um when when the band took the break that was it just happened to coincide with Stu ham who had been the basis for Satriani for a few Ooh. years at this point. And it really like almost stolen the show and so you know with this incredible bass solo. Yeah. And he's got his albums out and he's got guests on his albums that include Alan Holdsworth and Eric Johnson. So at that time playing with him that that means a lot. That's a big door that's opening. And it's my first time playing for uh, non-metal crowd, right? I mean, there are some metal fans there. They're there to see me. There's a little bit of overlap between, you know, those fans that like the Satriani stuff and like the heavy stuff. But there's a lot of people that have, you know, no idea who I am. Um, but it was great. It was an amazing uh, experience. Uh, keyboardist was on. Yeah, I'd never played with a keyboardist before. <laughs> I mean, now that it's it seems so crazy, but yeah, at that time I was just my all my experience was just limited to, you know, that the band, and um, to me, and it shows I, the other I, side of your playing. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I was growing. I was growing as a musician, and I knew you know I had a lot to say beyond what you could hear on on Testament, right? Um, and even. Uh, yeah, with that, I was very proud of the work I did, but it was, you know, it was it was just it was limited. You know, there's there's just there's more. There is more to music, and I knew I was going to be doing a lot of. I just felt it. I'm going to be an all around musician. Maybe people are going to just see me as the guy from Testament. Some still do, and I don't care. <laughs> but well, you're lucky to have those people. But you've also done a good job at, at broadening your your career. You know. Um, I think now people. Yeah, I'm lucky to have some of them. Some some of them are now that we have the internet. There's some I would rather not have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Most of them I'm grateful for. The vast majority, and the mo- mo- most the vast majority, except that I can have that side, I, and I can have other sides too. It's like being um, an actor. And I have my Marvel superhero film where I play some, you know, comic book action hero. But I can also do like, you know, an independent film with like very serious dramatic role. You know, right. so that's how I see it. You step into different roles and it makes perfect sense to me. But there's a few loud mouths that go around and, and you know, just talk trash on the internet. And it's not just me they talk trash about, but they, right. there are these trash talkers and there there seem to be more of them 
um, early on. Um, but the, you know, they're, they're still out there, but anyway, at that, the, so at the time of this record, yeah, my others, my side of the side of me outside of man is really developing because I'm touring with, with Stu and, um, I'm writing, um, instruction columns for mm -hmm. national guitar magazines. And yeah, and I'm still very proud of the work I'm, I'm doing, but it's also very clear that it's not going to be limited to just this. And so what makes you decide it's time for you to leave Testament? Well, it was a lot like uh, one of those VH1 behind the music things, you know, you know, there's always an arc in those programs and there's a point where it just, it gets really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there were the, there was, there was tension because of the, um, fact that I, you know, I had this, I was developing as a musician, but I would say even more so, um, just the, the pressure. And I think there were, there were identity crises. There was, uh, communication problems and not just with me either. Um, when I, I left two other members of the band would be gone right. within a year. <laughs> well, one of them within like a half a year. Uh, the other one, I guess, within maybe maybe a couple years, at least mm -hmm. after the next record. Um, so, you know, now I could use, use a term like toxic environment. It became a toxic environment in more ways than one. Would you say that those guys, because I think you were alluding to that they, they had a little bit of an issue with your career. Um, uh oh, yeah. Did, do you think they had a little issue with your, with your solo career and your, your, the attention that you were getting? Um, that didn't help, but I think, uh, it was, it was many, it was many things. Um, I think, sure, there was that, but there was also the fact, like, I was over the whole crazy lifestyle. Like, I was, even though I'm younger than everybody else, you know, they were all, they were already, like, in their early 20s when I joined the band, and I was, I was still in my teens. Yet, by the early 90s, I guess, yeah, I'm in my early 20s and I'm just done. I'm done with, um, you know, these all night parties on the tour bus, like every single night. Yeah. And just loud, you know, just chaotic rock and roll. Like, like it was wild. And you, you get it to ends a up. Point yeah, I mean, a lot of people get get burned out on that, but I I got burned out on that really young after like the first couple records. I just thought, and it's not like um, I I was morally opposed to you know parties and having a great, but you I probably just wanted to get to sleep. Well, I also wanted to do work. I just thought you know we should really be focused on music. We're here to create music. We're, we have this amazing opportunity. We're touring we have a record label we have a tour bus well why are we screwing it up by yeah just like letting everybody's friends on the bus after every show and just filling the bus with smoke and Ooh. loud music yeah and there's no if you're got a, a sane person there's like nowhere to go um you know now it's 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 different Right. Now, you know, these guys, they're, they're over it too. Like they, they could never put up with themselves back then. Right. They were just wild and out of control. And so that was creating a lot of problems. And I think it was affecting the music. And then the, that was creating tension. And um, I think also, you know, I, I was so young, I could barely communicate a thought when I joined the band. And then as I was getting older, I was becoming more communicative. 
and outspoken and I wasn't going to hold back when I thought they were making a mistake. I thought a lot of mistakes were being made. Yeah. So it's just, you know, many, many things, but it just, there was drama, there was tension. There was, you know, me having another side of myself as a musician, which shouldn't have been a big deal. But I think at that time, you know, being in a band, it was like being in a gang. So the idea of, you know, see, not being so committed to the gang that you could actually see yourself doing other styles of music, working with different music. Now that's yes. it's so much more accepted. And there's all kinds of musicians that are maybe in the band, but they have other projects. And I was going to say now it would be, uh, it's huge. It would, it would be appreciated. You would want yeah. So and the more that the, the more popular Alex Skolnick becomes, the more popular Testament becomes and, and, and the chance to to cross over. But I could see at the time they're not realizing that. But it was because, listen, I knew back then a lot of people knew your name, uh, especially if you were a guitar player and you weren't necessarily a thrash fan or, or uh, you knew your name and it was good for business. Um, but I understand. So the time comes for you to, to leave. And so we're going to jump around a little bit to your career after Testament before you go back. Um, so when I think about heavy metal and virtuoso guitar playing, of course, I think about the spin doctors. So, <laughs> um, so you've got to tell me at some point in your life, you get a call to audition for the spin doctors. Yeah, that's a crazy story. Well, it, that was coincidental. <laughs> so I toured with Stu Ham and Stu Ham, we, we, with the Stu Ham tour, it was a very um, low budget nuts and bolts tour. Yeah. Yeah. We're back, back to a van. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm used to buses, but I don't care because I'm just so happy to be playing with Stu and just playing, you know, this, you know, just re learning and just expanding as a musician. Uh, so we only had, a, a, I think we had three crew members total. And one of the crew members had worked for the spin doctors. So fast forward a couple of years and he's on tour with the spin doctors. And I think he'd been with them for, for years before they'd even blown up. So at this point they've, they've blown up, they're touring. So they had their own drama on the mm -hmm. road. I don't know what happened. They, you would have to ask them. But the it resulted in the guitarist leaving in the middle of a tour. So some like very intense was, drama had happened. So I get a call from um, my friend uh, Jimmy, uh, who's the tour manager, and he tells me what's happening. He's like, he, you know, he's on the road. It's been doctors. The guitarist has left. They need a guitarist. It's an emergency. <laughs> right. They need somebody like right away. Um, can you fly to LA tomorrow? Yeah, they'll they'll pay for you to fly to LA. They'll cover all, all the costs. Uh, they just they need somebody. They're going to fly a few guitar players out. So um, I think there were only like four of us, if I remember right. No more than six at the most. It's and, just that's incredible. You know, the fact that you couldn't say no disrespect to the spin doctors, but Alice Golnick could probably learn these songs on the plane. You know, I mean, that you wanted to try multiple people was a little crazy, but but go yeah. ahead. Well, I, and I had seen the band because they'd come through. My friend had called me up. Um, you know, do you want to come to the show? And I, 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 I dug it. I, I enjoyed the band. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I, they were getting played on the radio all the time. But I didn't know, no, I did not know the songs. I did not. Right. So next thing you know, oh my God, okay. <laughs> Let me uh, start learning these songs. Let me get the, get the record. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess it's safe to say I came in second. Who, who came in first? Uh, God, I don't even remember. Maybe we don't know. Yeah, I forget his name. If you, 
I think, I mean, he ended up in the band. I think if you look at who their guitarist was follow in whatever year this was, 94, I guess. Um, it, it's that, and he was great. Like I heard him and I just thought, I, and I, I did good. I, I really like kind of put my style. I made it work. I learned the songs. It sounded good, but this guy, like he had the right gear. He, I think if I remember right, he had a Stratocaster and he had the right pickup. You know what I mean? I was still used to my Ibanez guitars and I, I mean, now if I got that call, it's like, oh yeah, I have a 60s style Strat right there. Right. I know exactly which pickup, to, I know exactly which foot pedals to use. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and this, yeah, he was, he was perfect, but it went well. And the other guitarist, um, it was a guitarist from Edie Brickell and New Bohemians, mm -hmm. who I also liked. I had had their record and, uh, it was just really interesting. It was just this mix of all very different guitar players and they had, they needed somebody fast. They had to decide like right then. So they, his name was it. Guy's name was Anthony Krizan. I think that's how you pronounce it. That's the guy. Yeah, and yes. And he has no other credits. Doesn't mean he's not good, uh, but which is really strange. Yeah, because you know he was good, and I remember he sounded really good. Mm -hmm. And that, you know jumped he jumped on that tour while they were pretty high profile. But it goes to show as well that sometimes you know you think oh you're missing this big break. Well, we yeah. don't even know who this guy is, and he's the one that got the gig. So, yeah, the music business is so strange. I guess he, I guess he co-wrote the Spin Doctors' third album. Uh, mm -hmm. So, look, he made it last for a little while. Um, mm -hmm. They eventually went back to the uh, to their original guitar player. And yeah, I guess they patched things up. And it's always the danger of of stepping into one of those situations. But yeah. so. A little bit down the road, what's the next logical call from the Spin Doctors? How, how about Ozzy Osbourne, which fits you much better? Now, I think this is around 1995, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's literally, it's less than a year after the, the Spin Doctors thing. It might have even been like six months, you know. Um, and so that call comes in. And that seemed to answer the question. It was like, okay, this is why the Spin Doctors thing didn't work out because I meant to play with Ozzy. Of course. Perfect. Um, and I didn't know the whole backstory, but there was, I guess at that point, they'd had, um, Zach Wilde was doing his own thing and it was they were they were looking to move on from Zach, even though he'd recorded the most recent album, which was um, Osmosis, right? And um, they were just they were not doing a public audition. They were trying a few different players. I know um, Richie Kotzen auditioned um, some great player, by the way, uh, some others as well, but. For some reason, you know, I don't know. They were just, they hadn't found the, the right fit. And um, I ended up flying to London and auditioning, you know, with Ozzy in a dingy rehearsal place in London. And um, I was basically there for about a week. We ended up doing an unannounced show. Which was which all clips of it are on the internet now. Yeah, yeah. There's some some clips on the internet for sure. And um, it seemed to go well. Um, he basically, yeah, he seemed really happy. Everybody in the crew seemed said this was the happiest we've seen him. This feels right, you know. I'm sure. You've got this. Ozzy basically told me I've got this. But then the one person who sort of didn't congratulate me was was the one who was supposed to 
let you know if you're hired or not. So, um, she didn't seem disappointed, but I, I kind of got the sense. All right. It's not decided. And, um, anyway, I, bunch of time goes by, I don't hear anything. So I kind of assume nothing's happening. And then I find out they got, uh, the guitarist Joe Holmes. Right. Who had auditioned for them earlier on, I guess at the same time, Zach, he had been like a candidate at the time Zach Wilde had tried out. Um, but anyway, the whole, the whole experience was fascinating. And I'd never sort of been around a major celebrity before. And just that whole experience was just the, the human behavior aspect and how people act when they're around a big celebrity. And, you know, it's fascinating. And he, well, you know, he... It was a lot like the TV show. Like you, you yeah, know, exactly. The, Once the when the TV show came out, I just said, "Oh yeah, of course." I I <laughs> I was in this for about a, yeah a little over a week. Um. Yeah, so I don't know. So that that had felt like it was so destined, you know. Mm -hmm. That because I I didn't know what I was gonna. I was just going back and forth. I was trying different bands on my own. Um, and just having a hard time, but I was also learning. I was learning. I was learning what worked and didn't work. And um, I think after the Ozzy experience, I I didn't want to sit around waiting for the phone to ring. Right. And at that point, I just I really felt like um, I just needed a change. I needed to just study music and just become the best player I could be in different genre, all different genres. Well, before we jump to that, I got to say, I think you would have been the logical choice for Ozzy. You were already a guitar hero and maybe they didn't, maybe somewhere in the decision, they didn't want another guy who has a brand name because no disrespect to Joe Holmes and he played with David Lee Roth. He was sort of unknown when he joined the, the Ozzy world. So, you know, who knows what their deci decision was, but it seemed like it would be, the, the perfect thing to, to have you step into. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And if you look at clips from the touring around that time, he's like dimly lit. Yes, he was a back, he was more of a background player, not, not like Zach or one of the guys that was up there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was also like getting these messages, sort of subtle messages about my stance and lowering the guitar. And I realized, oh, I think, and now, you know, now I, having been in the music and en entertainment industry for a while and just knowing about casting and things like that, I think uh, they were very used to Zach. Yeah. And I think at first they were trying to make me more like that. They were used to like this you know, guitar swinging lumberjack thing. And I think, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. Obviously you do, you would have to ask her, but I would guess that it was, yeah, instead of somebody sort of known and somebody that's going to be this featured hero, let's just sort of take somebody we can, who can play well, but will sort of move into the background. Yeah. And that's how that was. And I, yeah, I wouldn't have been happy doing that no it, and this was a strange time in ozzy's career you know i interviewed robert mason the other day you know who's in warrant now and he was in lynch mob and he he was hired for that tour to sing backgrounds for ozzy you know off stage and he had a lot of similar stories you know sharon brought him out and they weren't sure about it and what's he going to do and he's going to be you know off off in the curtain and he had that you're stepping into a strange situation so i think ozzy was going through a lot of um, different things. But so what you're, you you were alluding to before this is that you wanted to, you know, broaden your playing a little bit. And I know that jazz was a big interest for you. So this point around 1998, you head to New York and you go to the new school, which is funny because that's where I went for broadcasting. Um, oh, wow. Yes. I was saying, so look at this, another a new school on that. But that's where I went to study uh, broadcasting and interviewing journalism. Um, I didn't end up doing it for many years, but it was a good skill to have. But so you went there um, 
for jazz guitar. And so tell me what that's like, because it's almost starting over again. Yeah, oh, it was. It was for sure. Um, well, it it, um, it solved three issues for me <laughs> to make that decision. So one was um, an excuse to move to New York because mm -hmm. I'd been visiting New York quite a bit. Um, and I just was feeling New York. And I would, there, there was just such a, um, a musical community at that point. And I was meeting a lot of um, jazz guitar players and other musicians. And I wasn't getting any judgment from them. It was like, they were like thrilled that somebody with my background was interested in enjoying their playing and, we would exchange ideas and you could pop bop from one jazz club to another. And um, everybody was enthusiastic and setting up jam sessions. And so I would come back from New York all energized and friends of mine would tell me, yo, you're sounding better than you ever have. What, what have you been doing? And I'm just like, oh, you know, I was in New York and I'm all energized and focused and then gradually just the energy of the west coast would just start to set in and i kind of lose my motivation i'd go back and visit i'd have all this <laughs> this fire again so finally I, I decided okay i need to keep that fire i belong there so i also i come from a um hyper educated family and you know me not going to college was always kind of a thorn in my, my parents. I mean, they eventually came around and realized that I had legitimate musical talent, but you know, they always wanted like bragging rights. You know, yeah, my son is attending this university, you know, I guess it's kind of a Jewish thing. <laughs> so by going to the new school, which had a great jazz program, it, got me to New York. It, um, it would help me fill in some of my gaps in musical knowledge, such as, um, you know, writing charts and just, you know, like highly advanced playing, playing with saxophone and Trump. Yeah. I still hadn't done that. Yeah. I work with keyboards with Stu Ham, but I, at that point I, I, I didn't know if you, you're playing with a trumpet player. How do you play? Like, I, <laughs> um, so you know, just this experience. I need to just take a few years off and just really, you know, um, focus on that. And uh, there were other things. You know, you you study other subjects too. You know, when you get a music degree, you study. You you get. I mean, you you take your pick. But I studied creative writing. Uh, philosophy. I had, you know, I had a lot of different interests. So it was, it's, it, yeah, it made my parents happy, but it also it was a way for me to not feel, you know, like I was, like I ran away from education. So I, I was able to get educated. I was able to be in New York. I was able to uh, greatly um, improve as a, as an overall musician. And um, I never, th I had never thought about going to a place like Berkeley, in Boston, for example, because I, you know, th there's like more guitarists per square mile there than anywhere else on earth. Um, it's so guitar focused. I think you played I, it smart. Well, I knew I didn't need help with technique. Right. I have. You also. I, have, I can play fast. That's not a problem. <laughs> And you but, also would have been very known if you went to Berkeley. Right. Everyone would have you would have been a spectacle. You, you, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Whereas in New York at the new school, you probably blended in. That's exactly right. Exactly. A few people knew who I was. Uh, a few drummers and some guitar players who would. Stood, and I, I, you'd be surprised, like how many uh, musicians in the jazz program had been metal fans. Mm -hmm. Uh, even a couple of that would go on to be like real, like cutting edge, top level um, 
jazz players even today. But uh, it was, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Um, so that from the late nineties till the early O's that, that was my focus. And I mostly played guitars that looked like this. Yeah. You had to have a different, uh, different tool. Yeah. Yeah. I realized I needed to separate them. So I, I've since learned how to do more, you know, to play an electric guitar and the same guitar that I might use with Testament. I know how to tweak it and run it through a rig and use it as a jazz instrument. But to really get those skills, I needed, yeah, I needed a different, totally different setup from the instrument to the amp to to the, the players, because the players I was getting this experience with were, you know, real, real jazz players. It wasn't like right. a rock. They were moving at it. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't it's, like bar band rock players. Oh yeah, I know a jazz beat. No, right. these are like, <laughs> like people do, Yeah, these are people doing it for real. Yeah, and so 2002, the Alex Golnick Trino, Trio releases your first album. You've, there's five Alex Golnick Trio albums, and these are jazz albums. I remember some of my friends who were Testament fans at the time. You know what the hell happened to this guy? He's he's off playing the. He's off playing jazz, and there's this almost attitude as if, oh, he's too good, you know, he's he's playing jazz, not really getting that you're doing another part of your life. And yes, Testament is continuing on in different things. And over those years, you did make sort of guest appearances and did little things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you weren't I mean, out of metal. I mean, yeah, yeah. At that, by that point, we patched things up. That we were friendly again. We worked out some some past issues and sure it was like okay we can be friends again i can even jump in and you know jump on stage or jump into in the studio and do some guest appearance so yeah it, it was it was fun but it definitely felt part time but i i did enjoy doing it and it certainly made me think you know i i could see doing this more i mean at that time, Testament was still going through lineup change after lineup change, and they were working out stuff that had nothing to do with me. So I didn't know if it would be with Testament, but I thought, you know what? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not done with Mel. I'm going to get back into it and do both. I'm going to have. I'm, I'm going to reclaim that side when it when it when it's ready and then as it turned out um i got asked to do a guest appearance for a band lamb of god that would become a well-known band for like the next wave of metal and um i had played with sabotage that was, yeah, was one of the which was, yeah, shouldn't leave out i played uh, on a record called handful of rain and uh, that was my the, my first time playing like melodic hard rock, too, which was I really in, enjoyed doing. I also I recognized that they really needed somebody like full time that was just all in for sabotage. Um, right. But I did play on that record, and, and you uh, toured too, right? Huh? Did you play live? Yeah, with I, I did a tour. Yeah, yeah. We we toured the U.S. and Japan. There's a, a live uh, recording from Japan that um, I can still get compliments on, on that. And, um, you know, I had known, I'd been a fan of the band in high school. We were all, I always liked the early uh, Sabotage stuff. Chris Oliva was a great guitarist, a real loss. Um, so that having played with Sabotage, a few years later, Sabotage sort of uh, gave birth to what would become the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Yeah. And shortly after I finished my, um, I finished my first album with the trio. And um, let me see if I get the timing right. 
I was almost done with, I guess I, I was still at the new school, but I think I was at my last semester. And Trans-Siberian Orchestra is becoming a thing. And they're splitting off into two groups. Right, East and West. East and West. And I, I got one of the strangest phone calls I've ever gotten in my life. You know, the, And it was from uh, David Krebs, who is a legendary manager. He yeah. was part of Lieber Krebs, who had handled ACDC during you know, the, their prime around um, Scorpions, Aerosmith. Mm -hmm. So at that time, you know, David Krebs has broken off doing his own management, and he is managing trans Siberian Orchestra. And, uh, yeah, I get this call. Yeah. Can you please hold for David Krebs? Wow. And then I'm waiting. Mm -hmm. And then I'm waiting. And, yeah, you know, he's one of these. It's sort of like this old school type of power person. Sure. You know, that doesn't say hello. Nothing. Yeah. So we've got this tour coming up. The group is going to be two groups. They need a guitarist for the other group. You know, the band comes from Tavitage. I heard the record, Handful of Rain. I said, who's that guitar player? That's the guy we should get. Hmm. Are you that guitar player? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what is kind of how it's... Started and then uh, they. So I, yeah, he. I met with him. Um, I met with Paul O'Neill. May he rest in peace. Who's no longer with us. And Paul had been the producer for the Sabotage record I did. So it was all kind of full circle. And uh, this was only like, gosh, uh, six years later. It was not that long, but it, it seemed like a long, long time. And at that point, yeah, I had moved. I had switched coasts. I had uh, gone back to school. But the, the chance I'd be an orchestra, I think it actually made a lot of sense to do because it was this. At that time, it was only it was less than a month long. Yeah, so it was only going to last part of uh December, I was only going to miss like a week or two of school. I could take my school with me. So I, mm -hmm. right. yeah, so I end up doing these tours and um, yeah, it's, it's just in the winter time. And that also helped kind of help me. That got me working on more of my electric stuff again, but also different. Yeah. And, and those also, tours, you know, those tours are very professional and you can almost be anonymous. You go and you do your part and you're in arenas and and uh, it's a nice little thing to do. Yeah. Well, actually, at that time, it was just theaters. OK. But it was, a, yeah, it was a very different experience. And uh, 2003, I, I was doing some other tours and I was busy and I didn't do it that year. But then... I don't know. The next year, it just made a lot of sense to do it. I kind of, I kind of missed it, and I thought, okay, let me, I'll do one more. And then, uh, two thousand four. Instead of it being my last one in two thousand four, yeah, I ended up being. I ended up doing like six more. I think I went yeah. from then until two thousand nine, and at, that was the time. Two thousand four was when it first did an arena. And then the next year was more arenas. And so right when it really started to blow up, that's when I was there. So uh, that became a big part of my year every year. I'm sure. Yeah. But by 2009, my trio was touring the world and we're touring with Rodrigo y Gabriela, you know, and, um, Testament has resurrected. I've rejoined the band. We've done, at that point, I guess we had done our first uh, reunion album, Formation of Damnation. 
And I just, yeah, I couldn't take two months and go and do this, this tour. Yeah, because the uh, things were picking up. And we were talking about players who do different things. You know, there's guys like Rod Morgenstein, who's an incredible jazz drummer, and he does the Dixie Dregs. And then he'll go, and he he'll, he was a teacher at Berkeley. I think he still is. But then he'll go off and play with, with Winger, you know. So that time, it was starting to happen more. We would see guys do other things. And now, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah, and Al and Trio has built a reputation, so it has an audience. There's fans of that, and then you have the Testament audience. So you found the way to juggle um, to juggle both of those careers, which probably is also more fulfilling for you as a musician. Yeah, no comparison. Yeah, I mean, and so, so so to have that, and so those Testament records are very well received. Your audience really likes them. They're reviewed well, and it's sort of uh, you know it takes a minute, but it's sort of back to business, and then. You did some shows with that classic lineup. Uh, you ended up changing rhythm sections, and and uh, and but you've had the current lineup for quite some time now. Am I right? That's true. Yeah, the current lineup um, has been together for nine years. It's a long time. That's, long, that's longer than I was there. The whole original first wave of the band. Do you think that there's ever a reason to reunite with the other guys, or do you think it's 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 done? I uh, probably shouldn't comment on that. Well, one, I mean, one, one guy one, has legal issues with the band, I believe. Yeah, that's the one I'm not going to comment Got on. Got it. Um, yeah. The other one, he's like he's a close friend of the band, still. So. He's almost like uh, an advisor. He's like in an advisory role. Uh, that's Louis, the drummer. Right. But he he was never somebody that's going to play drums no matter what. You know, he played in the band. When he left the band, he just didn't pick up his drums. Mm -hmm. uh, never played in any other bands. Uh, came back for the reunion stuff, got himself back in shape. And was doing, it was doing great. But then when it got to the point where, okay, we had, we had to make a decision. Like, we're going to either just do these occasional shows or we're gonna go in the studio and another thing that happened was we this offer came up to tour this incredible tour uh with um heaven and hell judas priest motorhead and testament and that yeah. really put us back on the map put it put us uh brought us to you know, whole new audiences and of course for that we needed a record so I was like, okay, we need to do an album. And um, in between the um, you know those periods of the band, so while I wasn't there, the drums had got they they picked really top drummers. They had John Tempesta, yeah, on a record. They had Gene Hoagland, who would eventually come back. He's now the current drummer. Um, Dave Lombardo <laughs> played on record, right? So you've got the like suddenly the drum level just went. So with all due respect to, to Lou, like these these are like the top guys. So and I I think he, you know he didn't want to tour anyway. So it was kind of mutual. It's like all right, yeah, I can get that. It's not for everybody. This is it's a big yeah. investment. I was ready to do it because I'm I'm going to do music no matter what. If Testament doesn't happen, I'm going to find somebody to play. That's not a problem. Right. I do not have a problem finding musical projects. I'm going to play full time. That's what I do. Uh, but Lou, you know, he really, he had become a civilian at that point. Sure. And, 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 and for those guys, it's different, you know, to get out there now and try to do, you know, fly dates and things. Everything is a different world. And if you're a civilian, it's not easy to necessarily jump back into. And, like you said, you've had your lineup now for a long time. And uh, and again, no disrespect to those guys, but I think you, Eric, and uh, Chuck is sort of the core uh, uh, of Testament. And um, so I'm, I'm going to jump ahead because this is um, Titans of Creation. This is 2020. And of course, this record gets a little bit lost. Uh, and, and it also this record is reviewed extremely well. It's a great album. And Testament fans, I, I know, have all really liked it. It, although it comes out in the year 
that you know time is forgotten. So, what is the plan? <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah, is the plan to uh, to when things pick up to get out and promote this? Yes. Yeah, I. I mean, we never got to promote it, so I think I think it only makes sense to. Uh, yeah, we don't want to forget. It shouldn't be a lost record. No. So, yeah, it makes sense to go out. This will be, this will be the the record we we tour with at least at first, and then it's a new. It's still a new product, and you know we'll link this in the description so people can um, check it out uh, for sure. Be, and, and we'll link some of the, uh, your your other projects as well, so people can pick up some music and hear it. And I think for those who may have missed it or not known this is out, this is great New Testament um, music. In addition to talking about Testament um, and the new album, I just want to make sure that people know that you've got a really great uh, YouTube channel that has just all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, play, uh, playing different styles of music, um, instructional, opinion, there's just so much stuff. And so I'm going to put a link so cool. people can get a look at that too. And I think, you know, um, you can go, you can fall into the Alex Skolnick uh, rabbit hole. You know, there's just um, so many different things and you have stayed active in this time. Um, you're not just sitting around. You're, you're producing content and things for people to see. And so talk a little bit about what people can check out. I've been hyperactive during this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I, I have a podcast and I know everybody, in the, my cat has a podcast at this mm -hmm. point. Um, but I've been planning it for a long time and um, it's different. It's different. It's definitely more inspired by a story podcast, such as Serial or um, This American Life. So it's it's got a different feel than most conversational podcasts. And um, there are some surprises there, too. Um, my most recent guest, I don't always have guests, but I had one recently that everybody's heard of named Peter Frampton. Oh. And... Uh, I did a deep dive into his music. We talked about it. Um, I did an extensive, unfortunately we've lost a lot of musicians, but I, I've gotten really into the tributes. There's a two part Van Halen tribute. Um, in his case, I play some of his parts and just talk about, you know, his um, musicianship and sort of break down some of his music. So the podcast is called Moods and Modes. Um, it's 14 episodes so far. I, it comes out usually twice a month because it does take some time to put the episode together. Sure. But um, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of variety. Um, all different types of music, all different types of music is, is discussed. Uh, so I've been very busy with that. I've been um, writing. I've been writing f for a long time. I've, I, I wrote a, a memoir a few years ago. Yeah, geeks, uh, geek geek to guitar, guitar hero. The guitar hero. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I was blogging regularly on a blog. I'll in, once Instagram came along, that sort of became my blog. So I'll do these. I'll go on these um, thought tangents. Sometimes, sometimes they make headlines. <laughs> I've learned. Yeah, uh, but I recently did one. I did a written piece for a genuine um, news journal alongside like war correspondents and writers for like from places like the guardian and the new yorker and it's called new lines and the piece is called shut up and play your guitar and it's all about being an artist in today's uh climate the today's social climate uh that that's gotten a great reaction um i've been messaged privately by like very high profile artists that I can't name. Mm -hmm. um, I've met the spin musicians. doctor. Was it the spin doctor? Mm -hmm. Bigger. <laughs> um, I've met people that I, I hadn't known before that were that are familiar with this article. Um, so yeah, between writing, podcasting, a lot of. Um, collaborations i've probably the majority of music collaborations i've done are with um charlie benante 
the mm -hmm. drummer best known for Anthrax, who's a very diverse player, by the way. And you can see that because he's he's been doing all kinds of uh, these collaboration videos. But one of the very first that really blew up was YYZ by Rush. Right. And that was me, him, and Ra Diaz from Suicidal Tendencies. And that just, that was before collaboration videos were a thing. Right. So th that, it was a year ago, a year ago this month. But we've since done several, and I've I've done songs by McCartney, by um, Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty, but you know, just a lot of variety. Black Sabbath. A total variety. You have current pop stars and all, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, to me, it's, you know, music is all, if I like the music, you know, there's, there's good music and bad music. That's all. Sure. That's all there is. And um, yeah, uh, a lot of um, I'm writing a lot of music. Uh, I've got got a lot of instrumental music ready for that will probably come out next year. And um, I started a Patreon. And I, so I do tutorials and um, special, like exclusive content for my patreon members and um yeah it's oh i have i have a photography page so i i keep busy yeah well it's i don't want to you know i don't want to be wrongly quoted uh, you know for this but i this i always i joke i'm gonna miss this pandemic yeah i got more yeah. done you know i, I yeah. finally had time to get things done and follow uh you know uh goals that i've been talking about for you know uh, 30 years like you said everyone has a podcast but for me it's something that i always wanted to do just other things got in the way now is a good time to do it now is a good time to talk to people um because they have time if you were touring right now uh you know you wouldn't be able to sit and talk about your career for two hours you know what i mean so um there are some good things that have come out of this time and exposing people to new music especially yeah yeah I mean, it's, it's very similar for me um i had been planning the podcast i did some jams with some favorite musicians of mine that are in new york i'd recorded them recorded the conversation uh invested in a great microphone that's right mm -hmm. here <laughs> but you know the last few years I've, I've been on the road hundreds of days of the year literally um Stu ham and i reconnected so i've been touring with him uh, we've recorded some new music that's going to come out. Um, there's some some other artists that I've recorded for. Um, my own trio has, been, so I've just gotten so busy with touring. So that, yeah, I, I could not get to the podcast. And then that that was one great thing about being home. It's like, okay, <laughs> I have no excuse now. And I you're guess. passionate about what you do. There's a lot of these podcasts that you can tell this is a cash grab or a, an attempt at a cash grab because most people will not put the effort in <laughs> to actually see the monetization results. But, you know, a lot of people go, well, and there's also people who just go, well, I'm home. I'll try this. Um, but you can see in, in your case, especially, this is not something, well, I'm going to just make a quick buck. I'm going to do this. No, it's something that you, you can tell that you've wanted to do and that you're good at and you're good at communicating um, with other musicians, obviously, as well. And right. I think that that's something that shows. I put the same effort into it that I put in, into music. It's like, you know, it's a piece of art. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I want, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I, it's hard for me to compromise. It would be hard for me to just kind of go for quantity over quality. That's why another reason why I don't promise it every week. Right. And, you know, I think if I had a different format, and it was more of a talk thing. And I was, if I was really good at that, some people are really good at that. Right. Uh, my friend Dean Del Rey, the, the comic, Ooh. he's a master. Like, could you sit and talk? Yeah, he's got two podcasts now. Yeah, and his podcast is called Let There Be Talk. I've, I've right. been on, yeah. and yeah, I and I can listen to him, and I'm I'm in, engaged, and he does a great job. I'm not that good at. At talking, I can get, I can get some good content, but for me, it's better to 
mix it up with narratives and um and and not do it every every week but i do it twice a month and uh yeah it's become a big part of of what i do yeah and i think uh, and that's important because i think i bit off more than i can chew a little bit i saw people cranking these things out said i'll do three of these a week it's no problem and then you realize that it is work and then at some point i i, I got the guy <laughs> I got a slow day. I got the guys from Trickster fighting over, uh, you know, whether there'll be a Trickster reunion. And, and uh, blabbermouth headlines about Jeff Pilson, you know, studying yoga. So, uh, yeah, sometimes you, you got to work on the the, the, yeah. the quality of these things. And, and speaking of that, I've really enjoyed spending the this time with you because uh, I think we've learned a lot. And I think for people, I, I'm sure for you, you're so busy right now talking to people about their careers that and it's, You've, it's been a while since you probably talked about your own at this much length. No, no, I just, I just did did uh, something like this the other day. So, oh, see now you you just ruined the uh, now Sorry. the blabbermouth <laughs> headline is going to be Alex Skolnick says the same old stories again. <laughs> <laughs> I Which wish was, that would be the headline. <laughs> it would be a nice change of pace, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm but I'm sure. Well, but anyway, Alex, I'm gonna so we'll have the link so people can check out more of what you're doing. I really appreciate you spending this time, wasting this time. Yeah. No, it was and, great. Uh, Good and hopefully we'll see you. Yeah, thank you. And I hope that we'll see you uh, and see Testament on the road. There are some some plans, right? Yeah, later in the year. It looks promising. I'm not going to promise, but of course. I'll just say, you know, things look more promising now than they did. So Yeah, so I hope that I'll not be seeing you. Yeah, absolutely. Hope I'll be seeing you soon enough. Thank you, Alex. Okay.